Okay. <laughs> One of the senses you will... No, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm losing time. Um, one of the senses in which uh, the famous statement of Gaudium Spes 22 that has already been abundantly quoted um, has been interpreted by John Paul II, especially as we all know, in Mulieris Dignitatem and his Catechesis on Human Love, is through the nuptial category or analogy. In other words, Christ reveals to man his most high calling also because he reveals the call of man and woman to mirror in and through their reciprocal love, the life of God himself, as communio personarum. The intermediate term of the multi-layered analogy that makes possible to grasp this reciprocal illumination between the two extremes is, of course, as we all know, the union between Christ and the church, the nuptial mystery, by definition. But we won't focus on it, although I teach Christology, but, but uh, for reason of time. So that was the first part of my paper, but... Uh, <laughs> We, we want rather to focus on the most critical pole of the analogy, the, most, the one that is usually most under discussion, the Trinitarian one. First premise. Second premise, I can't also delve uh, into the pre preliminary technical but also important question of whether it is actually legitimate to speak of analogy rather than metaphor. I mean, I'm using here the, the, the classical language of you know, Thomas. So, and, and uh, I, just, I just say what is my position, I give my, then it, it, we can, so, so I, what, my proposal is to speak about quasi-proportionality. So, and with this I mean, I just say that, and then, and by this I mean if we define analogy of proportionality in a proper sense, in the term of proper versus equivocal predication, it is hard to speak of analogy between the Trinitarian communion and the nuptial bond. I, I, I say that, I agree with that. Also on biblical ground, because the, the scripture doesn't, doesn't go so far, so I don't think it's legitimate to go that far. One cannot claim, in other words, that the analogy here works exactly in the same way and sense in which it works, for example, when we deal with the analogy of proportionality between the, the transcendentals of being as predicated of creaturally being goodness or, or truth, and, uh, and uh, uh, divine being. In this case, goodness is predicated properly of both, although the difference in the modus significandi, the way of, in, of signification is, is infinitely different between the two poles. In our case, instead, I can't give, it seems to me, the name of bridegroom to the father or the name of bride to the son, just to be clear. Um, because no matter whether we conceive the essence of God, as I, th I think we must, in terms of fruitful self-giving love, the sexual difference seems to be constitutive of the polarity husband-wife. It cannot be accidental in the sense that it is only in relation to the union between Christ and the church, which entails the body as means of the sacramental union, that the New Testament uses explicitly nuptial language. However, our claim, my students know I like paradoxes, so however, our claim is that precisely what seems to forbid the analogy to be an analogy of proportionality, that is the sexual difference, is indeed what, is indeed what makes fitting in, in many ways I mean, the sexual difference with all what it brings with itself, it's what makes the analogy to be fitting. Once we come to see, not only, as we all are used to say, that there is in God something analog analogous to the sexual difference, that is, the infinitely greater difference of the oppositio relationis between father and son, but even, that's probably the most audacious claim in here, but even there is something analogous to the role of the body in the personal gift of self that 
the, the, the simple act of the Trinitarian being is, as we will claim. And this something is, to go back to the discussion this morning, the erotic dimension of the act. I, I decided to call it this way. But So the passionate receptivity that is inherent to the gift, qua gift. Since the first is more familiar, I will focus my exposition on basically on the second aspect, but then, if God wants, I, I, will, I will be able, because the argument is incomplete without, of course, the third dimension, which is fruitfulness, that I, I consider inseparable from, from, from this point. And uh, if there is time, I will elaborate at the end on fruitfulness, because it is the necessary conclusion of the argument, without which the previous point does not stand. And uh, what I would propose is that actually it would be better not to speak about two ends of, of marriage or of the nuptial bond. It would be better to speak about one end or one end in two or even one end. That's my, my, my challenge. The only end, in a sense, is total union. But my point would be there cannot be unconfused and total union without fruitfulness. So, so that, that's the claim. So the inseparability is ontological. Is there is a reciprocal requiring of the two things. So let, let's go. Um, first, um, of course, we have to qualify what are the constitutive elements of what we consider the nuptial, the nuptial, nuptial love. And here is the first, in a sense, we are used to, to, to account for, for the structure of the nuptial mystery in terms of three elements. I, I propose five, um, but I mean, three, but one of them, which is the one I focus more, which is unity, union, uh, to me has to be qualified through subdivided in this sort of other two elements. The first and primary, um, when did I start? Okay. The first and primary end of nuptial love seems to be a desire for total union. To become one into una caro, Genesis 2.24. But this immediately requires qualification what is the modality of this union, the mode of the union? Let us briefly elaborate on this. First, the end of nuptial union seems to be truly total without the exclusion of anything. I shall, you shall be one flesh. The end of nuptial love is to become truly one. This is why we associate to nuptial love, as we know, the act we call gift of self. Through it, each spouse assumes, as it were, and receives the other into his or her very self, so that each of them is no longer oneself alone, but somehow also through the ecstasies of this possession, the other. Second, the mode of this union being the fruit of a free spiritual ecstasies entails at the same time the abiding and confused distinction of personal freedoms. The two lovers become one, and yet they remain perfectly distinct from each other, unitas duorum. They become one by way of mutual indwelling, perichoresis, me in you and you in me, to use the favorite expression of, of the Gospel of John. This mutual indwelling is the stable fruit, though, of the gift that is the act of reciprocal dispossession. And here there is, there is the first qualification I want to make. It is by way of ecstatic dispossession that I make of my person the dwelling place of yours so that you no longer live and suffer only in yourself, but also in me, Galatians 2.20. It's not me who live anymore, but Christ in me, etc. That Dionysius quotes actually when he speaks about ecstatic love. Conversely, it is still by way of this possession that I come to dwell in you, sharing with you all what is mine. Of course, Christology here is in the background, the, the communication of idioms between the natures. All what is mine is yours, and all what is yours is mine. John 17. My beloved is mine, and I am his, says three times the bride of the song. Interestingly, the, la the favorite language of the nuptial book, by definition, 
is the language of reciprocal belonging. Three times in the song we find this formula, which is also, as we know, the formula of the covenant. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Your, your God. It seems that this language of reciprocal belonging is the specific language of, of nuptial union. Intriguingly, we find the same language also in an author that is usually accused to be the least biblical and most unforgivably neoplatonic among the ancient masters of Christian thought. Of course, I'm speaking about Dionysius, who says, Eros is ecstatic. It does not allow the lovers to belong to themselves, to be of themselves, but it compels them to belong to their beloved. However, for Dionysius, Eros is not only ecstatic, better, in order to be ecstatic, it must be also jealous. It would be interesting to elaborate on this necessity, but I don't have time. Jealousy indicates for Dionysius not only the intensity of one's care for the other's good, but also the drawing dimension of love. The lover's desire for reciprocation, which is required for the union to be both total and unconfused. The lover in this way does not only say, I want to be yours, he also yearns and begs for the reciprocal. The act of self-giving always already bears within itself a receptive dimension without which nuptial love is not itself. Recapitulating, nuptial love entails first a desire of total union, total share in each other. Second, this union takes place by way of reciprocal free dispossession, whose end is mutual indwelling. So the rest, the mutual indwelling describes more the restful moment, it seems to me, the, reciprocal, the language of belonging more the, the act. Third, this mode of union requires that the object of the lover's will is both desire to give and to receive ecstasy and jealousy, to use the Indonesian language, without any priority of one desire over the other. Fourth aspect, we know this, the nuptial bond requires a difference that opposes but also draws the lovers toward each other. One is primarily giver, the other is primarily receiver. And this is, of course, the ground of the analogy between sexual difference and, and trinitarian difference, uh, father and son, we know that. Fifth and final dimension, nuptial love is inherently fruitful or overflowing, which of course is fully apparent in the birth of the child, but is not limited to it, as we will elaborate on this uh, more later. As apparent in the child, and I go back to the point that Adrian was making this morning, this fruitfulness seems to be not just external to the desire of union of the spouses, but rather the full accomplishment of it, as we can glimpse, I like to use this, this simple example, through the beautiful somatic fact that any child resembles usually both parents. In this way, the third effect, the, the third, the child, effect a sort of admirable exchange of idioms, to use Christological language. Why? Because each spouse becomes able to give to the other not only what is his, but even in some real way what he received from the other as we especially see in the mother. The bride in becoming mother becomes able to give not only what is hers, but also what she received from and through him enriched through her own gift. So she gives back in a sense, the giver. So um, next point, um, now we jump at the, to the Trinitarian level and here it becomes dangerous. So. I mean, it's, it's a beginning of the thought more than a thought. Um, next point, title of the next point, yearning goodness. This is an oxymoron that I, I, I will make clear later that I borrow from, from Dionysius. The first constitutive element of nuptial love that I want to address, okay, I skip difference because for reason of times. I will co go back to it hopefully at the end. Um, it's already 10 minutes. <laughs> is uh, um, union by way of reciprocal gift of self or dispossession. Our claim is that the nuptial analogy is on this point particularly precious 
or integrating the father-son relationship. I mean, somehow I think we need all of them because that's, that's more apophatic. It's not too cataphatic. The real apophatic is the reciprocal illumina illumination of the different relations, it seems to me. But, but uh, um, our claim is that the nuptial analogy is on this point particularly precious because it allows us to qualify the content of, the, of that act we call guilt, gift of self and that in the divine triune life coincides with the simple act of being that each divine person is in its proper way. Tropos te superclus, mode of subsistence. Let us consider the act of the father's generation of the son. So it is well known that Ansurs von Baltas are following on this, the Russian theologian in linguistic terms, uh, Sergei Bulgakov has gone so far as to describe the father's generative act as a urkenosis, urkenosis that finds, of course, in, as we know, in the historical self-emptying of Christ on the cross, its most perfect analog analogical epiphany. This seems to perfectly fit with John's theology of revelation. We know how much John is important for Balthazar, although, and this is my first point, just linguistically. Although, in fact, John never speaks the language of kenosis and self-denial. And now I want to try to show why I think so. First, in the very moment, I mean, why John? Because for John, Jesus reveals the Father in and through the very gift of self on the cross. No? Who sees me sees the Father. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. First, in the, in the very a moment in which we take seriously the language of kenosis and self-emptying, we have immediately to ask ourselves, it seems to me, what is exactly the content of the will of the Father in the act of giving himself away? And on this, I mean, we can have a discussion. I mean, I agree that there is only one will, one conscience. I think it's more paradoxical. It's one and it's three at the same time. But then we can, we can talk about this. Uh, um, and the answer must necessarily be to give all his being away to the son, letting the son be through his gift. Now, it should be evident that this will to give requires simultaneously two opposite things, the father's will to be and the father's giving away. There is no way out of this seeming contradiction. In fact, in order to give myself away seriously, I need to possess myself and I need to want this possession as much as I want to give myself away. Affirmation of oneself and denial of oneself, will to be and desire to give oneself away irretrievably, require each other and must be simultaneously without any su succession or precedence of one over the other within the spiritual act. The simple point, if we correctly see reveals that the language of self-denial, if unilaterally taken, I mean, uh, uh, we need it, but if unilaterally taken entails, it seems to me, a too cataphatic, to use Dionysius' epistemological categories, reduction of the gift to our finite opposition between affirmation and denial, which in our context becomes opposition between holding and giving, or between one's will to be and one's let him be. The problem is then to determine the content of the will, of the giver's will, in such a way, but also the receiver. I mean, of course, it's the same will possessed in different modes. It's exactly the same. Or be between one's will to be and one's let him be. The problem is then to determine the content of the giver's will in such a way that his will to be and his will to give ir irrevocably away his being could be held together in a way that lays beyond uper, affirmation and negation as the supereminent unity of both. But how is this possible? How to keep together the seriousness, to use a, a word of Hegel, the seriousness of the giving, I give you all myself without condition, with the necessity, eros, necessity, need, desire, of the lovers dwelling within the gift as the source of it. In answer to, the quest to this question, maybe could be the following. Self-emptying 
can't be this exhaustive description of the content of the act. Within this very giving dimension, there has to be always already the receptive desire of the answer, of the beloved, affirmation of oneself through the other. As the condition of possibility of the gift itself to be itself. I would propose to call this erotic dimension of the nuptial act begging dimension. The beggar is not just the one who has nothing, but the one who, since he has nothing, because he has given away everything, accepts to rely upon the gratuitous gift of, the, of another, honoring him or her as the only possible res rescuer of one's being. In conclusion, it is only the simultaneous unity of self-emptying and begging or sacrifice of Holocaust. The Holocaust for Israel was this burning all the victim in thanksgiving and prayer of entreaty, if we want to use the language of sacrifice, yes, no? that allows the lover to be present in the gift as the one who truly belongs to the beloved. We go back to the language. Without this moment of erotic dependence on the response, the act of chaotic self-emptying, forgive me the play of words, is emptied from within. It is indeed deprived of its humble character because the lover does not really hand his self over, does not truly really belong. In fact, he is no longer present within the being he, has gi he is giving away. If there is a moment of denial, then it must be understood as one's refusal, refusal to be oneself but through the other. We can in this way better grasp in which sense Dionysius could say, in our opinion, very accurately that God is elevated beyond affirmation and negation. It is, only it is so because in the purely spiritual Trinitarian exchange, self-affirmation and self-denial are simultaneously present. Okay, I skip Richard of San Victor who actually, okay, Richard already glimpsed the importance of this paradoxical necessity of including eros within the perfect goodness of the Trinitarian relations. Quote, to be much loved by the one whom you love much is proper to love, and without this, there can't be true love at all. Thereby, love can't be joyful if it is not also reciprocated. Next point that follows from him, from this active passion. Now, an important qualification must be made here. The element of passive desire is, that's why the language of agape eneros, I think it's not, must, must be overcome because it, 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 it keeps alive the ambiguity. The element of passive desire is in the act of love not less generous than the kenotic or free giving dimension. If there is a distinctive element of erotic love or of nuptial love, it, this is precise. Wow. That's why I argue the language of the song, the Song of Songs is the book of the mystics. If there is a distinctive element, this is precisely the element of intense pathos, as Gregory of Nyssa already insightfully observed. Eros is agape epithetamene, love full of tension. Eros, spiritual or carnal, here is not important, not only tells us, tells us about receptivity, but also about the intensity of the lover's desire of union. Richard of St. Victor again pointed this out more clearly than anybody else when he says in his The Four Degrees of Violent Charity, you know well enough that it is one thing to speak about love and another thing about its perfection. One thing to speak about love itself and another about the violence of it. This element of intense passion that Richard calls violence, far from being insignificant or a just romantic accident, points rather to one of the main reasons, we argue, why the nuptial analogy is so crucial in biblical revelation. <coughs> Nowhere as in nuptial love, as the Song of Songs metaphorical language superbly shows, we experience the transformation of desire into a generous gift through which the lovers give each other joy. A bridegroom never gives himself to the bride simply, free consent. We, he gives himself and his desire of the union, where the intensity of this desire substantially affects his power to give joy to the other. <coughs> it is hardly deniable that the joy a lover gives 
to the beloved is proportional to the intensity of the desire that endows, as it were, the free act of giving. The reason of this is quite evident. Through the expression of one's passion, the lover makes the beloved aware of her power to give him joy through her yes. <coughs> he gives her to be all the more giver. Now, we know from an agraphon of the Lord quoted by Paul in the Acts of the Apostles that there is more joy in giving than in receiving. And this is why the erotic lover in a relation of free and stable reciprocity becomes the more giver, the more he is desirer. He becomes, to use a, a John 9 image, he becomes source of quenching water precisely through the bleeding of his wound. One can make the case that this paradoxical transformation of desire into gift is not less true of the begging child in relation to his parents, as Peggy so, insight so insightfully points out in his portal of the second virtue. And I already wrote on this. So, But what is distinctive of nuptial love is the fact that the gift that the lover desires is the total union with the person of the beloved is the beloved himself and not his gifts or inheritance as more visible in the child. For the bridegroom of the song, the inheritance, the promised land, the garden is the bride herself. Sam Bernard point, pointed out this distinction between childhood and, and bridal role in his sermon 83 on the Song of Songs. The Dr. Meliflu seems to find the reason of the intensity of nuptial love precisely in his exclusive character. In fact, the child loves and honors the father also because he is his heir and he receives everything from him. For the bride, love itself, given and received, is the only prize. Okay, I, I have to skip the quotation because time is running. Uh, um, besides the fact that this opposition between son and bride it becomes problematic when, when uh, we transfer the idea to the Trinitarian communion. Bernard's intuition wonderfully helps us to better see how much the nuptial analogy can be important in order to account for the form of the Trinitarian act of love qua entailing a total gift of self. An important qualification at this point can, can, can be made. I already in, announced it. The act of love is not generous and erotic but generous as erotic. It is generous only as a unity of free, total self-giving and desire. The kenotic dimension of the, of the act highlights the freedom that characterizes the gift, but the act of love is fully generous only as a unity of free action and yearning passion. And this thanks to the third, otherwise it doesn't come out, so I have to get there. In this sense, again, Dionysius gave us the most perfect definition of the essence of nuptial love. Erotike agathotes, erotic goodness or good eros, which is the same. The oxymoron, the oxymoron keeps together the element of ecstatic giving and the element of drawing desire without collapsing them simply into each other and yet showing their unity in the simplicity of the act. If we now turn our attention to the John 9 narrative of Jesus' death on the cross, we can easily see that the two climatic, climactic moments of the narrative symbolically reflect this twofold dimension of the act of love, ecstatic or self-emptying and drawing. On the one hand, Jesus' final act of pouring forth the spirit, paredokentopneuma, follows closely the solemn cry, I thirst. On the other, water and blood pour forth out of his side, pierced by a spear. In both cases, a symbol of self-emptying and total giving is associated with a symbol of intense yearning, thirst and the pierced heart. In this way, as we suggest, John invites us to contemplate the glory of God as ineffable unity of passionate yearning and free self-emptying, both expressed so humbly and intensely at the same time through the concrete body of Jesus. In the supreme hour of the uplifting of the Son of Man, it becomes finally visible at once what is ultimate. God's, gen God's generous thirst of union with the church and the Father's eternal love for the Son that in the first is visibly mirrored. And this is why, that's the point that came to my mind yesterday, this is why the Eucharist is the most perfect concrete icon in history of nuptial love. 
because there we see the supremely active self-abasement of the actus purus that God is, and at the same time is expressed through what is most passive, bread and wine. No, even by far more passive than just the Jesus human body. You know, it's the, there is this sort of inversion of the, of the logic of creation in Genesis. First the garden, then the animals, then Eve. Here you have this sort of inversion. So first Jesus, for, first the Logos becomes man, then becomes the lamb on the cross, and then Eucharist. So, and so you have this, this unity of total action, of total freedom, free self-emptying, and total surrenderness. He's so given over, he depends so much that you can do whatever you want with, with, with it. So uh, uh, in this way, the polarity spirit body that characterizes nuptial love as such, and that's the confirmation of my initial point, as both constitutive of the enactment of nuptial love shows its original glory as a mirror of the structure of being's act, as it were. So let me finish. The full joy, fruitfulness as a condition of unity. The last point we need to address is fruitfulness, and therefore, of course, we already glimpsed, I mean, joy is, is the key in, 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 this, in, this, in this play. No? The, the last point we need to address is fruitfulness, and therefore, the role of the Holy Spirit as bond between the Father and the Son. Here I want first to turn the attention to the highly sim symbolic language of the Song of Songs. One of the most disconcerting features of the song is that, uh, that usually is noticed, is that no explicit allusion seems to be made to the openness of the lovers to fruitfulness. There are no children in the picture. And yet we want to make the claim that fruitfulness is very present in the song. Although not in the form of children, but in, I would say in a prior sense, in a more ontological, but it doesn't deny, no? Let us go back to the point we made above. We suggested that nothing as Napshaleros rightly understood allows the spirit to surpass through existential experience the irresistible temptation of opposing giving and receiving in terms of greater and or lesser dignity as a, and active power. Because in the circle of love, both one's desiros, receptivity, and free giving give joy to the other. They both give. Now, we suggest that this joy, which would never exist without the actual reciprocal and desirous gift of the spouses, impersonates, so to speak, in the song that almost hypostatic third, which is the fruit of the reciprocal gift. And that alone allows the union, as I'm going to show, to be what it wants to be, that is, total. We don't have the space and the time for a thorough examination of the text, we limit ourselves to the essential. If we read the song as a coherent whole, we will notice how the bride seems to suffer a, a, a progressive transformation through the development of the, of the drama. At the beginning, she seems to be more passive and shy and receptive. And then the more the drama develops, she becomes more active, more giving, more desiring, desirous to give. And then at the end, she's you know, the super powerful queen you know, that keeps the, 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 the king captive in her tresses. You know, there is this inversion of roles that he's the king at the beginning, she's the queen at the end. So we suggest that this order, this progressive transformation of the bride from receiver into giver is not accidental. I'm, I'm done. It is precisely. <laughs> It is precisely the fruit of the lived circle of love given and received. In fact, the choicest fruits she offers back in the crucial central chapter four, she offers back to the bridegroom are the fruit of his love for her, are the fruit in her of his reception, of her reception. Precisely in receiving the bride becomes powerful giver thanks to the exuberant joy that she gives him through her very welcoming him. Through the analogy of joy, even before then through the one of the child, we become in this way able to appreciate the role of the Holy Spirit as both unifying bond and overflowing fruit. Why? It is only thanks and through this overflowing joy that the receiver, the son, going back to the, to the Trinitarian, can receive not simply the father's substance. And that's the point we were making with Adrian but also the very idiomatic character which is uniquely proper to him, that is to be giver. 
Conversely, only through the overflowing joy that the Holy Spirit hypostatically is, the Father can receive from the Son the very hypostatic character which is only his to be receiver. Of course, this requires the filioque somehow. In this way, we grasp perhaps a first reason of the inseparability between union and fruitfulness. The desire of fruitfulness is intrinsic to the, to to the desire of total union and not parallel to it. Because without fruitfulness, the union, the exchange cannot be total. In this sense, a careful reading of the song can offer the best response to the romantic reduction of love to closed intimacy. In a sense, it is precisely and only through a third, through fruitfulness, through overflowing, which is not necessarily only the child, but the being for a mission. The fruit of the reciprocal gift that can happen, the miracle that the romantic lover truly yearns for. A union that is truly total, yet, yet truly allows to share in everything, nothing excluded, even the exclusively personal idioms. And yet a union that is not tragic, because it doesn't require the dissolution of, of the difference, but actually confirms the goodness of it. We come also in this way to see why and in which sense, in the ontological structure of nuptial love, the respect of the difference in taxes, which is what uh, today is more uncomfortable to accept, and so they also the language of headship that is proper to marriage is not against the complete equality between the lovers, but it is actually constitutive of it. In the logic proper to the nuptial mystery, there is not just a position between difference, unity, and fruitfulness, but rather a strictly necessary co-implication only through the procession of the third the personal scent of love given and received, the original giver and receiver can receive what belongs only to the other. A second and final argument, I, I'm done with this, <laughs> can be made in the same direction, which is once again centered on the concept of goodness or generosity that actually with also the first part is, is the all encompassing idea in here. No, bonum est diffusivum sui, we claim bonum est also receptivum sui. No? Uh, the last claim is that not only there can't be a truly generous gift that is unerotic, but also that there can't be a truly generous gift without fruitfulness. The argument is the, log is the logic and intrinsic conclusion of all what we have been saying until now. Without fruitfulness, the total gift of self would deny itself as gift because the faithfulness to itself of the act of giving would remove its generous character through its erotic one. As we have seen, even in God, the first lover needs the beloved's reception in order to be himself, that is, giver. But this means that the lover can't be truly generous because he can't give more than what is actually necessary for him to give in order to be himself. The element of freedom that is inherent to generosity would be in this way emptied from within. And this, it seems to me, is why the bridegroom must be paradoxically able to give more than himself in order to be truly generous, in order to give a generous gift. We come in this way to the, perhaps, uh, okay, the, um, the opposition between obedient faithfulness and freedom that is so painfully at the center of today, or between creativity and, 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 uh, and nature, between nature and freedom, can ultimately be overcome only through the self-transcendence of the gift in fruitfulness. The free, generous character of the gift requires its fruitful overflowing through the beloved's reception in order to remain itself, that is, full of grace. Only through the fruit, the reciprocal gift of self of the spouses can be what it actually is, a giving which is both natural and free, generous, a response to the urging calling of Eros, to a natural call, and yet a gift that bears the character of an irreducible freedom. And, I mean, I, I will...